Acts chapter 13, uh, verse 1. Now, in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And here we see the divine calling and work of God through his Holy Spirit calling Barnabas, calling Saul uh, to venture out on a missional venture of faith. And this strikes close to home for us uh, this week. In particular, last week we said goodbye to Pastor Russell uh, Holiday, our operations uh, pastor, and his wife Sarah, who is our, our, has been for so many years our worship director here. And God has called them to a venture of faith. And you know it's a mixed bag, right? Because on the one hand, um, it's painful to say goodbye. You know, we, Russell's been with us for, for four years um, and, uh, and with many of us for longer than that. He's been on staff for four years. And, uh, you know, and God has done an incredible work in, the, in this. And I call him a kid because he is a kid to me. He's younger than my youngest child. Um, and I, that probably says more about my age than about him, his youthfulness. But, um, but yeah, I just, I just love what God's done in that kid's life. I mean, here's a guy, you know, he was, he's living in Knoxville. And, and, and Knoxville, you know, got the better of him. And, uh, and so he, he moved to California. When he came to California, he was strung out on heroin and looking to get clean, looking to get sober, looking for a change in his life. And, and here is where he met Jesus. And Jesus changed his life, radically transformed his life, missionally used very particular people in very strategic places to, to, to reach him and to be a part of his rescue and his redemption. And we got to play a part in that. Pastor Rod being able to disciple him and train him and in coming to here and merging our churches together and me then getting the opportunity to disciple and train him and seeing God's call in his life and watching God form and shape him. And, and, and so, you know, there's, there's pain in the saying of goodbye because you grow together. But, you know, on the other hand, it's, it's invigorating what God has done, this great testimony. And then, you know, for four years, we've been, we've been working to this point, recognizing God has a calling on his life and knowing that there's that, if you will, that spiritual placeholder that God has placed, you know, on Russell, where four years ago he said, this one, he's going out, get him ready. And then four years goes by, and then the Holy Spirit says, separate unto me, Russell and Sarah, for the work that I've called them to do. And now, you know, they're, they're off to Knoxville. And, and you know, it's, it is a very stepping into a raging water kind of venture of faith. Because you don't know what's going to come out of it. We talk about, hey, he's going to go plant a church. Well, he's, he, that's what he wants to do. We'll see what God is going to do. Because statistically, half of all church plants fail, right? We consider it a failure. God's just doing a work. And he used that as a vehicle to do this work because the church plant, first and foremost, is about the planter and the, God is, the work that God's doing in that planter. And so, so it's this mixed bag. On the one hand, it's painful. On the other hand, it's exhilarating. Here's a guy launching out onto a venture of faith. And what's most invigorating about it, here's my point. What's most invigorating about it is the heart that's behind it. Because the heart that is behind it is nothing short of direct obedience to the Great Commission. Jesus, he himself came on mission and he has called us to mission. 
right? He said, you'll be my disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. He said, go and make disciples of all the nation, the great commission. And it all stems from the fact that we serve a missional God. I like what David Livingston said. He said, God had only one son and that son was a missionary. Think about that sentence. It has profound implications. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus himself said this, that the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? You were lost. I was lost. Russell was lost. We all at one point in time were lost. And because of the person and work of Jesus, we've been rescued, we've been redeemed. And it's just an amazing thing to think about it. Consider the Apostle Paul writing to the Philippians. He said this, though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, Jesus humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Why? Why? Why would, would God do such a thing? Well, the Bible tells us that this missional work of Christ is manifold in its purposes. It is many. Jesus came to reveal God's glory, the Bible tells us. He came to reveal God's love for sinners. He came to seek, to serve, and to save, and to ransom and redeem fallen mankind and ultimately die for us. He came to bring great joy to give eternal life. The Bible says he came to bear witness to the truth and that he came to bring light to a dark world. And Jesus, quoting from the prophet Isaiah, when he began his ministry, very first thing that he did, he went into the temple, he took the scroll of Isaiah, and he shared these words. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And at that point, Jesus closed the scroll and he said, today these words have been fulfilled in your hearing. Now listen, this is the mission of Jesus. We share that mission, and that's where we left off last week. That the church in Antioch sends out Paul and Barnabas, and where to, and for what purpose? For they've, they've gone to the mission field, and for what purpose? For the purpose of the Lord. The Holy Spirit said, separate to me, Paul and Barnabas, to this work that I've called them to. And so verse 4 being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. And so they go first to Seleucia. Seleucia is uh, about 15 miles west of Antioch, and, uh, and it's a port city. And, uh, and, and their objective, they're not going to Seleucia um, for, you know, that's not the target of, of where they're going to do their, their, their evangelical missional work. I'm sure they were missional in the process, but going to Seleucia for them is very much like us. If we're going out on the mission field, my wife just got back from Europe on the mission field a few weeks ago. When she, when she left, um, her, her target was, uh, you know, it was London, England, and it was Scotland, and, and that's where she was ministering. Um, but where'd she go first? She went to LA. She went to Los Angeles. Why? Because that's the port. She had to catch her plane there, right? And that's what's going on here is they go to Seleucia, they jump on a boat, but where are they going? What's the deal? Well, they're going to the island of Cyprus. And it's, it's very interesting there because this is, this is Barnabas' hometown. And if you're taking notes, this is our first point, that missional living begins at home. 
We talk about this idea of missional living, and that's what we're seeing here. That's kind of the big E on the eye chart of this, of this text. What, what, what's it like to live missionally? And missional living, point number one, begins at home. Barnabas goes to the place he grew up. That's where he starts. Hey, we're taking the gospel to the Gentiles. I know a bunch of them. Here we go. And so they go, they, 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 they go there to, to Cyprus. Now, not only do they begin in a familiar town, notice also it's a familiar culture. Our text tells us that they preached first in the synagogues, plural, of the Jews. Why? Well, there's two reasons for this. Number one is an issue of priority. Priority. Paul said this to the Romans. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Here it is. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. So the gospel's for everyone, but it's first for the Jews. Now, when Paul speaks of the gospel bringing salvation first to the Jews, what he's doing is he is alluding to the special relationship that the Jews had with the Messiah. See, the hope of the Messiah had long been held by the Jews, right? This is all of the, the, the entire Old Testament is looking forward to the Messiah. That's what it's doing. And so uh, they're looking to, to, to their Messiah and Christ is their Messiah. They're looking to the Messiah who is of the lineage of David, and Christ is the son of David, of the tribe of Judah. And in Jesus' public ministry, he spoke of being sent to the Jews, and he focused his efforts on them. Now, did he focus on, on Gentiles as well? Yes. Did he save Gentiles as well? Yes. But his primary focus was to the Jews. Why? Because he was the Jewish Messiah and he had come in part to strengthen Judah and to save the tribes of Joseph just as Zechariah had promised and prophesied. And so when the gospel of Christ was first proclaimed, the Jews were given priority. And we see this prioritization in Paul's first missionary journey. You will see as we go through the book of Acts that he always starts at the Jewish synagogues. This is where he starts his work. So that's the first reason uh, that they began in the synagogues was, uh, was this issue of priority. But the second reason that Paul and Barnabas began in the synagogues is an issue of pragmatism, or if you will, of, of practicality. Right? Understand, there was a custom among the Jews of this day, and it was known as the open synagogue. And the way the open synagogue worked is that if you were a learned Jewish man and you were in uh, a new city, uh, then you would be invited to speak to the people of the synagogue in their Sabbath meeting, right? And so this is, this is just a wide open opportunity. They know going in, Hey, Paul's a learned man, and they're going to go, oh, hey, you're in town. You, floor is yours. So, so it's open mic night, so to speak. When he walks in, wherever he goes, hey, hey, hey Paul, it's open mic night for you. It's funny. Um, illustrations just come to me. I think in illustrations all the time. And so I'm putting the message together, and, uh, and I read a story about uh, Ed uh, Sheeran, um, most of you know who Ed Sheeran is, right? He's a, you got to understand I'm old. I don't know anybody, anybody new in music. I'm like, I usually don't know who they are, right? So Ed Sheeran, you know, he's, uh, unless you're living under a rock, I mean, even I know that, that he's a famous musician. But um, I was going to make a joke and say he's a famous actor or something. But anyway, no, he's, he's, he's this famous musician. You know how he got his start? An open mic night. Right? It was, it was a, an event that was hosted by Jamie Foxx, and uh, it was an all-black event, which is hysterical if you think about it, because Ed Sheeran is as white as they come. He's redhead. Uh, he's almost transparent, you know, to look at him. And uh, he shows up at this all-black event. He's unknown, undiscovered, unsigned. He's the only white guy there. And so Jamie Foxx is recalling and he's retelling the event and he said this. He goes, all of a sudden, 
I, you know, I say, ladies and gentlemen, Ed Sheeran, and he pops out with red hair and a ukulele, and it was just like a movie, he said. He goes, I go, well, let's see what the kids got. And he says, he goes out there, he played for 12 minutes, and he got a standing ovation, and the rest is history, right? Open mic night. So it's open mic night in Salamis here, and Barnabas and Saul, they're going for it. They're driving it like they stole it. They're going to all the different synagogues, and they're preaching the gospel. Now, Luke doesn't give us the details. We don't know how they were received in these synagogues initially. We, we'll, we'll know next week. We'll see, you know, that that uh, doesn't go so well over time. But we don't know how the message was received in, in each individual synagogue. Um, but that's not the point. Here's the point. It's not how well people respond. It's how well you represent. It's not how well they respond. It's how well you represent. See, it's not our job to convert people. It's not our job to convict people. It's not our job to convince people. It's our job to tell people. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we're told, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to tell everyone a reason for why you believe like you do. Right? So, th so, so, so this, is, this is our job to represent. And you know, the thing is, is that when we represent, we're acting like Jesus acted, right? We are acting as his ambassadors. An ambassador, the dictionary describes as an official envoy. It's the resident representative of a kingdom. See, the thing is, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, this world is not your home, right? You might be a citizen of the United States, but... but that's little C citizen as far as the Bible's concerned because you are a capital C citizen of heaven, right? And so that makes heaven your kingdom. This earth is your home and you are a resident representative here of the king of our kingdom and that's Jesus Christ. Paul said this to the Ephesians. He said, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And, and a key thought in that, as we discussed last week, is, is this word distinction. That there has to be a, distinct, a distinction about us. There has to be something distinctively different in us than in the world in which we live. And this is what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, when he talked about how we are salt and we are light. And, and, and he talked about how, you know, the, the idea, salt is, among other things, it's a preservative. And so the idea in this world in which we live, it's rotting and decaying, and so salt is needed. And if our Christianity is rotting and decaying, then, then it's not going to be any good. We're not going to have anything to give to this rotting and decaying world. And the same thing about light. Light is needed because the world lives in darkness, and if our life is imitating the darkness, then we don't have anything to show the world, anything to shine forth for the world. So being the light of the world means that we're not only light receivers, but we are also light reflectors, right? And so we have to have someone to shine to, and we have to do it intentionally. Now, we see this, pun intended, ref reflected in John chapter 20, as Jesus commissioned his disciples. Listen to what Jesus said. It said, Jesus said to them, peace to you as the Father has sent me. That's, that's missional commission language. Jesus is saying, I've been missionally commissioned by the Father. As the Father has missionally commissioned me, he says, I also, here it is again, I send you. I'm missionally commissioning you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And so right here in these two verses, we see the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they are acting together as senders. The Father sends Jesus missionally. Jesus then sends his disciples missionally. And the Holy Spirit then empowers his disciples to live missionally. Now understand, this is fundamental to who God is, that he is a missional God. And so missional living, it's not optional for us. It's not incidental. 
In other words, we can't participate in Christ without participating in his mission to the world. They're part and parcel. They go together. And, and missional living doesn't just happen by chance. It happens intentionally. And that's what's happening here in our text. The Spirit of God says, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul to the work that I have called them to. Now, Jesus illustrated this principle, this intentional principle, again, in the Sermon on the Mount. He compared us there to a lampstand. He said, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. He said, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone who's in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The idea is that just as lamps are placed higher so that their light, their light can be more effective in the same way that you and I should look for those ways that we can let our light shine in greater and broader ways. And those, those ways, they almost always come if we're paying attention to it by invitation. Remember the church of Antioch, fasting and praying. And then they hear the voice of the Lord. Separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work to which I've called them. And clearly within that, he, may, he revealed that it's the island of Cyprus. We don't get the details on, on how they got that. We don't know. But we got the important part. They're fasting and they're praying and they're seeking and they're willing. And God says, this is what I want to do. And so... For us, thinking about how we're going to let our light shine, it's a matter of being, being yielded to God and saying, where are the opportunities for me to let my light shine? I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, the object of our shining is not that men may see how good we are or that they even see us at all, but that they may see grace in us and God in us and cry, what a father these people must have. He said, is this not, and he's referring to Jesus' message there about the lampstand in his Sermon on the Mount. He says, is this not the first time in the New Testament that God is called our Father? Is it not significant that the first time that it peeps out that God is our Father should be when men are seeing the good works of his children? So biblically, we see that God the Father enacted missional living. We see that Jesus Christ embodied missional living. We see that the Holy Spirit empowers missional living. And now you and me also, God's children now have the duty to exercise missional living. And that brings us to our second point in our notes today, if you're taking them. First one is that missional living begins at home. My second observation is that missional living reaches out it reaches out. Notice in verse six, it says, now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, next week, we're gonna dig into this Bar-Jesus dude. It's like, who is he, right? And, and what we're gonna discover, and we'll talk about this again next week, Bar-Jesus literally means son of Jesus. And basically, this guy was a phony and a fraud. Jesus obviously uh, kind of made a stewer and a big sp splash uh, when he was on this, this, this earth. And so this guy is trading on Jesus's name. He's basically billing himself as, I'm the son of Jesus. And, uh, and so, and he's going out and he's trying to draw people to himself, right? He's a false prophet. Um, and so we'll see that he's got nothing to do with Jesus, but that's for next week. What I want to call your attention to is a simple detail that you might miss here in verse six. Now, I read the text to you in the New King James Version. That's what I teach out of, and then in the New King James, it simply says, when they had gone through the island, right? But most translations offer a, a more specific a description of this event. Most translation reads something like this, that they went through the whole island. And that's more to the fact. 
And it sounds like a small distinction. It's actually a really big distin distinction. I'll illustrate my point this way. Um, several years ago, I was going to my son-in-law's graduation. He was graduating from nuclear school with the U.S. Navy, and we, were, we wanted to go to his graduation. So we, we took, we had an RV at the time, um, two happiest days of a man's life, the day he buys his RV, the day he sells his RV, all right? And so, um, yeah, same applies to boats. Um, I don't know that it applies to motorcycles, at any rate. So, <laughs> I wouldn't know, I've never owned one. But at any rate, um, we're driving across country in our RV, and, and we had to get from, from California to South Carolina, North Carolina, one of the Carolinas, South Carolina, I think. So we had to get there, right? And it's clear the other side. And my point is, we drove through the country, but we didn't see the country. We, I saw gas stations, and uh, I saw, you know, road stops where we stopped to sleep. But, but for the most part, we just went through, right? But the distinction here is that they went through the whole island. The idea and the point of distinction is this, that it, it, what it implies is that there was a strategy of outreach, that, that, that they were strategically going through the whole island. We want to reach everybody. We want to spend time with everybody. Understand this. Culture is the context in which we execute missional living. Culture is the context in which you and I execute missional living. Let me say it this way. Missional living doesn't happen inside the church. It happens outside the church. That's the idea. And engaging the culture outside the church is the key component to being a missional Christian, right? Now, when I talk about engaging culture, I'm not talking about that you're making friends with everybody inside the Christian bubble. I'm saying the opposite of that. I'm saying that you're taking time to engage people outside of the Christian bubble, reaching out to the community that you're in, taking time to, to understand their needs and their desires and their hopes and their dreams. And did, did, did Paul and Barnabas have the opportunity to do that on a missions trip? To, maybe not to the extent that, that we might think of missional living uh, as it first reaches home and then you know, begins to extend out from there. But they were certainly trying to engage people on a cultural level and taking time to get to know who it was they were talking to. And here's, here's my point, that engaging culture, it's a, creep, it's a, a significant part, critical part, of you living missionally. And what that means is like you, you take time to get to know your neighbors, you know, on a very simple level. Years ago, you know, I, we moved into a new neighborhood, and I decided moving into this neighborhood, I'm going to do my best to, you know, at least know my neighbors. There's a start, right? And in and, and, and knowing them, you know, I just, you know, in particular is one, one neighbor, and I could tell um, this neighbor didn't know the Lord, and I thought, well, I'm going to get to know him, and, uh, and I, you know, just as a, as a regular person, and I, I just want to, I, I want to try and be a good friend. I just want to be, try and be a good neighbor. And, and so, you know, I didn't beat him over the head with the Bible, you know, God squad here, open up, you know, I've got to talk to you about Jesus kind of thing. Um, and it's not that I shied away from that either. It, it was just, I, I kind of, I just want to take the time to get to know him, let my light shine there. And, you know, in time, there would be an opportunity and several opportunities, as it turned out, to where, you know, I could have a deeper, more spiritual engagement with him because I first showed him um, that, that, I, that I was just a normal guy who just was interested genuinely in being, in being friendly, right? And, uh, and now, do we have a duty as Christians to contend for the faith? Absolutely, we do. Jude 1.3 says that we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, right? So, so yeah, we do have this duty, but the idea is that we stay faithful to Jesus, we don't compromise his message, we, we as, you know, 1 Peter 3, we looked at earlier, talked about earlier, we sanctify God in our hearts, we stand ready to give an account of the faith that we have, 
And, uh, and as we have opportunity, we share the gospel. But listen, apart from engaging our culture relationally, then when we contend for the faith, it's going to fall on deaf ears. Now, engaging culture is often referred to as contextualization, right? And this is when we contextualize the gospel, this is using what the apostle Paul called the means. He said this, I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And now this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you. In other words, listen, the idea of contextualization is simply this, that we show people how the gospel is relevant to their actual lives. Now, notice I didn't say that, that we, you know, how we make the gospel relevant to their lives. We don't make the gospel relevant to anybody's life because the gospel, all, the gospel already is relevant to people's life. Our job is to show them how it's relevant to their life. Let me, let me, let me explain it this way. Right now, I'm, I'm in a master's program in the last year, thank God, of my master's program. And, um, and there's, I'm currently reading a book. Uh, it's called Mending the Soul. It's part of the program. And, and within this book, we're, we're, we're really focusing in um, on, uh, on trauma, uh, on, on, uh, on sexual assault, uh, victims of abuse, um, and, and it's, 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 it's horrifying stuff that, that, I'm, that I'm reading. Just the, the perniciousness of evil and how widespread uh, the damage of sexual assault is. And, and this, tragically, this is the age that we live in. We are living in an age where there are many victims of abuse, uh, of assault, men, women, and children who, who've been sexually abused, um, who've been violently assaulted, who've been raped, who've been molested. Um, and, and just in case I needed the information, which we, we don't, but, but, it's, but it's just there, this statistically would include several of you in this room. And so maybe it's you, or maybe you have an unsaved neighbor or a friend, and they're a victim of this. And you ask the question, how is the gospel relevant to them? And how do I contextualize that for them? Here's how. The gospel message is that Jesus was himself assaulted, that Jesus was abused, that Jesus was beaten, and ultimately Jesus was murdered. And Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same testings that we do and yet he did not sin. And the good news of the gospel for these victims in our day is that we worship a God who himself identifies not just with specific suffering, but with their suffering, with your suffering, if this is you today. Not only does Jesus identify with them, but the Bible says that God covers their shame, that, that God cleanses their sin, that God makes them clean and righteous in his sight, and that he gives them a new name and a new identity. Listen, no longer are the abused defined by what their abusers did to them, but by what Jesus did for them through his own abuse on the cross. Listen, no other religion, no other philosophy offers a God like that. And guys, he's revealed through you. He's revealed through me. Just letting our light shine before men and women that they can see our, our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven, just choosing, I'm gonna live my life missionally. I'm gonna contend for the faith and I'm gonna take the time to put the gospel into context for the people that God puts me in, in, in connection with and puts in my path. I ran through this list at the beginning. I close with this. Jesus came to earth missionally to live among us 
and Jesus's mission and our mission, Jesus's mission to reveal God's glory, to reveal God's love for sinners, to seek and to serve and to save you and me, to die for our sins. And he came to bring us great joy and to give us eternal life and to bear witness to the truth and to, bear, to, to bring light to a dark world. And he invites us to be partakers of that and to be distributors of that. And it's a wonderful thing. I want to close with five questions and we'll pray and partake of communion together. Yeah, I know, five questions, right? Here's the deal. I want you to write them down. I really want you to take a walk with them, prayerful walk with these questions. Number one, ask yourself this. What are some specific ways that I can join Jesus in missional living? And remember, you don't have to come up with a creative list. Jesus said, my father's always working, and I too to this day, Jesus said, am working. God's doing a work. All you got to do is pray and lean into that. These disciples praying and fasting, and the Holy Spirit shows up and says, there's a work I'm doing, and I'm inviting Paul and Barnabas to it. Same thing for us. Question number two, what are some ways that, that I can or should be prioritizing my witness to the world? The priority of our witness. How, am I, how should I be prioritizing that? Question number three, what are the pragmatic or practical opportunities that are available to me to reach out to my community missionally? Question number four, how can I contextualize the gospel with those that I encounter? And question number five, what am I defined by? And do I have a biblical understanding of how the gospel is relevant to me? Thank you.